I think we'd like to start um, with a quiz. So Bill Franks, I'm going to ask you a quiz. Okay. So uh, I'm going to actually go ahead and ask you two questions. So my first question to you is what percentage of analytic insights will ultimately ever deliver their expected business outcomes? And then the second question is what percentage of big data projects do you think actually fail? So knowing from other surveys, these are always disappointing numbers. So I'm going to, you know, coming in cold, I would guess the first one will unfortunately be less than half. And the second one will certainly be more than half. I'm not sure exactly by how much. Right. So good guess. Um, so as a statistician, I'll say you are somewhat in the margin of okay. error. Um, we'll call it a pass. Um, so the answers are about 20% of analytics insights ultimately deliver their expected business outcomes. And incredibly, 85% of all big data projects fail that are sponsored by organizations. So those are some pretty big numbers. Um, and, and that's a lot of investment in analytics and data science platforms. Um, and so, you know, the obvious answer or the obvious question to these answers is, you know, why? Why, why does this happen? Why are organizations investing so much and then not seeing the return? Well, depending on the website that you look at and depending on the source, you know, there's there's a lot of answers to those very obvious questions. But, you know, there are definitely some common themes. And so those those common themes are, number one, not having the right talent. So not aligning the needs of the project and not aligning the needs of the organization with the talent that you actually bring in. Um, second, you can see there is solving the wrong problem with the wrong tools. Uh, so I was actually talking with somebody yesterday who wanted to talk about how fabulous they were at doing random forest solutions, and it was a great tool, but it was not solving the problem that we actually had. So solving the wrong problem with the wrong tools. Third is not having the right data. I mean, how common is this in organizations? So you bring in potentially the right talent with the right tools, but ultimately they don't have the right data to work with. And then finally, not considering the wider societal impacts. And I know this gets into some of the things that you've done, Bill, as it relates to like ethics um, and, and really bringing to data scientists' attention. It's not necessarily what they can do, but ultimately what they should be doing or should not be doing. And so when you look at these four issues, you know, there, there's a, a lot of different ways that organizations are kind of considering these four issues and these four themes. But, but one thing that, that we've seen, you know, being both um, on both sides of this issue. So Bill and I have both spent time in the private sector and working for universities. And we can tell you that when organizations come to universities with these four problems, um, there are a lot of things that universities can bring to the table to help alleviate and mitigate these issues. Um, but when you start talking about reaching out to a university to try to engage in partnership to generate answers to these issues that hopefully will will result in higher returns on investments in data science projects. You know, the obvious question is, if I want to partner with the university in the analytics and data science space, where do I go, right? Do I go to the business school? Do I go to the College of Computing? Um, is there a school of data science? You know, where would I even go on a university campus? Um, and the answer to that question is not obvious. And, and I'll come back to that in a little bit more detail in just a minute. But I thought it might make sense to provide a little bit of perspective on how universities are thinking about analytics and data science before we get into how organizations are partnering so, you know, analytics and data science is actually still a fairly nascent discipline at most universities, and it really has kind of grown out of this intersection of um, mathematics and statistics and, of course, the business school uh, and computer science. Yes, those of you that have dealt with computer science um, know what that picture is. And then finally, um, I like to say that if we were going to have a mascot, for analytics and data science, it would actually be the platypus because the platypus is sort of this mammal that lays eggs and then it has a duck bill and it has these web feet and it kind of lives on land and lives in the water. And so it's really hard to classify 
And I think we see a lot of these same issues uh, within the university context. So again, if you were gonna go to a university to try to partner in the analytics and data science space, where would you go? So that actually brings me to my next question for you, Bill Franks. And that is, where do you think most analytical programs are housed at universities? Yeah, I know there's, there's a lot of choices. Um, I'm going to say it's probably a random mix in the sense of I know my entire career uh, in the corporate world, we never fit. The analytics team never fit. I've been under uh, IT. I've been under finance. I've been under strategy. Uh, you know, it's all over the place. And I feel like I've seen the same pattern in academia. They don't really know where to put analytics. And I've seen it placed just about anywhere. So no, your your guess is actually spot on. Um, and so that's that's actually exactly what we see, which again is is back to that that image of that platypus. Yeah, and I think the key here is there's two things. One is this illustrates that there's not a single answer out there. But I think as you look to partner with universities, possibly the most important thing here is to understand that where an analytics program is housed will influence the curriculum that that it's going to cover and how technical it is. So for example, a data science program under engineering is probably going to be pretty uh, far on the technical side. If you're in a college of business, it's probably going to be a little more on the business, a little less on the deep dive uh, formula and algorithm side. Mm -hmm. And it's not that either one of those is right or wrong, right. but when you partner, you want to make sure that you're getting your needs met. So you want to really consider around the local universities uh, that you're that you're looking at partnering with, what are your needs today from a talent perspective and how is what that program is producing matching that? And I would advise you probably might end up working with multiple schools at any point in time and, act, and the distribution could change over time. You might today need more technical people and you're working with a college of computing or engineering. And then in a few years, you have a period where you need more businessy people and you're gonna work with a college of business and that can shift. And I think that's uh, that's okay. Yeah, no, it's actually a really good point, you know, and and these programs could ultimately have the same names, right? I mean, yeah. so you could have a school or a program of um, a master's in applied analytics or a master's of science in analytics, and that program could have the exact same title and the exact same name um, and be housed in the College of Business at one university and then housed in the College of Computing and Math at another university. Um, so I think your point is really well made. So, you know, just maybe going in a little bit deeper on that, again, maybe giving the audience a little bit of insight into how universities are thinking about these disciplines. I think roughly universities kind of think about analytics and data science um, either inside out or outside in. So what do I mean by that? So some universities will actually be approaching this fairly nascent academic discipline with the model on the left which is where they're really training students to become scientists of data. They are actually learning data science. They're learning about X's and Y's. They're going heavy into the math. They're going heavy into the computational sciences. And then their area of application almost becomes secondary. So they're, they're becoming truly scientists of data with an area of application in marketing or in finance or in healthcare or in manufacturing. But ultimately every student in that program is, is really studying the same core and that is the science of data. And these programs tend to be a little bit more computational. They tend to be a little bit more mathematical. They're probably gonna be more closely aligned with colleges of engineering, um, of mathematics and statistics and computer science. This is in contrast to the the um, format on the right. And again, a lot of universities are taking this approach as well, where students are studying something, they're studying healthcare, they're studying biology, they're studying marketing, they're studying finance, and then they're all coming in and taking analytics typically as more of a, um, a, a minor field of study or as an add-on to whatever their major is. And so these types of programs tend to be more closely aligned with the social sciences, with the health sciences, and with colleges of business. So neither structure is necessarily better or worse. Neither structure is, is necessarily um, one that is gonna be preferred over the other. It just, again, goes back to your point, Bill, and that is ultimately, what does your organization need? Um, again, kind of thinking through what are the skills that you actually need in terms of an analytics and data science professional? Are you looking for somebody who's a little bit deeper in the computational sciences, which would follow the format on the left? 
or are you looking for somebody who's a little bit more applied and understanding the area and the domain of application, which would be more aligned with the programs that are, are formulated on the right? And I think the key here is just making sure that you, you've identified what you need. And if you just let a general corporate partnership team or HR team go out and look for universities to work with, they might not understand the nuances of, un, of, of the different programs. And you end up with literally, you know, whoever they happen to partner with, they think they've done a great job. And in a year or so, you realize you're not recruiting the kind of students that you had intended to recruit. Right. And I think that goes back to, you know, these issues that we brought up in the very beginning as to why projects fail, right? I think these issues in terms of partnering with the university to ensure that you're bringing in the right talent is very closely aligned with that first point. Yeah, and I think we've got, you know, things around universities that can help with each of these. And I, I think we'll go through these as we cover from uh, undergraduate to master's to PhD. We'll go through each of those a little bit. And we'll start to dive into some of the specific details that help you make these decisions and pick the right programs. And you, you just see here a, a couple of things. But, but most of all, I'd say it's developing that talent pipeline uh, and, and getting to know students before they've graduated so that you can really cherry pick uh, some of the best for your organization. Yeah. So speaking of talking about different types of programs and the different levels, there's really kind of three levels of students at a university, right? There's undergraduates, masters, and doctoral students. So let's just start with undergraduate programs. Um, I recently retired after having been on a university campus for almost 20 years. And I can tell you that fall is a very special time at a university because that's when we're really um, welcoming all of those brand new fresh faced undergraduates to campus for the first time. And you can always spot them, right? Because they're either walking around their, with their campus map or increasingly now they're walking around their phone and they're trying to find their class, right? So, you know, when undergraduates show up on campus, you know, this is kind of the vision that they have of themselves and, and how they think they look. But certainly for those of us that have been around universities for a while, I can tell you that from the professor's perspective, this is, this is what we see. Um, when we see those newly minted undergrads coming on campus. So, you know, undergraduates are, you know, obviously different than master's students and doctoral students. Um, and I'm not going to go through all of these, but, but there's kind of a common framework across all undergraduate programs. And this is not unique to analytics and data science. This is going to be true whether you're talking about the humanities or engineering or, or the health sciences or, or anything in between. There's, there's um, a list of what we call these high impact educational practices, basically the things that make a difference in an undergraduate's experience at college. Um, and you can kind of go through that list. Um, and I've got the, the um, reference there at the bottom for anybody who's interested. But I can tell you that those last two points, capstone courses um, and internships, that's really the secret sauce for undergrads in terms of really learning how to do ultimately what they're going to do after they graduate, um, because most undergrads don't come in with any previous work experience. And, you know, what they learn in the classroom sometimes is very different from what they're going to experience when they walk onto, um, onto a job campus. And so what, what we find, especially in the analytics and data science space, is that this becomes a very rich, very robust space for corporate partnerships. And it's it's definitely mutual benef mutually beneficial, not just for the students, but also for the organization. Yeah, and I think the key, when you talk about a partnership, make sure you're pursuing it as a partnership. And a partnership means people are getting value both directions. So obviously, as the corporate partner, you should be getting some type of value back in terms of getting some work done, getting some research, helping to, to find some new things you could, you could do with your business. But it also means... Uh, focusing on making sure you're giving educational and research opportunities for students, right? That you know the university's primary mission is students and and putting them through. And so the more that you're able to help their educational process and and let them do research that helps them, you know, absorb the material better, that that's going to get you a lot of points with the university. Second, the research and publication opportunities for faculty, particularly those who don't yet have tenure, they desperately need to do research, get published and uh, prove themselves and working with companies is a terrific way to do that and if you can get a professor 
uh, involved. And that professor can see that working with you is going to get them some, some substantial papers and visibility. They're going to be your best friend and they're going to work really, really hard. And then last, you know, you are going to expect, we'll talk more about this as we go, that you're going to have to pay some money, at, uh, you know, and some funding to help the programs. It's not inexpensive to run a university any more than it's inexpensive to run a large business. And, um, you know, eventually uh, we have to make sure that uh, we're covering our costs. So one thing to make this easier is that more and more universities are now starting to have people on staff who come from a business background. I mean, take myself here at KSU. I've got, you know, 30 years in business before I came here. I came from the business uh, area to come and offer my perspectives to a university, but I'm not alone. Just here in Atlanta, there's a gentleman I, uh, I know at uh, Emory who similarly had about 30 years in business. He's now helping them in their, in their analytics program. There's a gentleman at Georgia Tech who came out of the business world someone right up the road in just uh, in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, who came out of uh, one of the large banks and helped their program. So I think the point is that people are now starting to come into a university to help bridge this gap. Because I think mm -hmm. corporate partnerships used to be a little bit dicey. And the reality is a, a standard professor who's never worked in the business world will struggle with some of the protocols and some of the terminologies of a, uh, a business environment mm -hmm. and these people that have the background are able to bridge that gap. So you should look for the person at the university who feels more like a consulting partner than a traditional academic. That's going to be your way in because that person can not only help map what you need to what the university has, but then mm -hmm. identify the right people within that university environment. Yeah. And I just to add on to that, I think most universities that have kind of been walking this maturity curve over the last five to 10 years will almost always have somebody who's come in from the private sector who will be the primary point of contact for these analytics and data science programs. Yeah, I think that's relatively new. I'd say 20 years ago, there might not have been near as many, even 10, but the mm -hmm. last few, most, most universities have it. Mm -hmm. It's also important to remember and realize, and we're going to hit on this a couple different times as we go, that university is not just another partner. It's literally a different type of partner. And you've got to come in knowing that. It's not a consulting firm. It's not a short-term patch because you're short resources this quarter. It's not ongoing staff augmentation. And it's not always the cheapest path either, right? Mm -hmm. you, you can have, uh, when you're, you're getting involved with, with you know, tenured professors and PhD students making a decent stipend, the, the, the cost, our costs at a university can actually exceed some of the offshore costs that you can get. But that's not the reason you're working with the university. So you really want to make sure that not only yourself, but your legal team, and your uh, HR team, and I'll understand it's a different type of partner. And, and, and you'd say, well, why would you mention it to the legal team? Well, I could tell you, you know, we're a state funded public university. Mm -hmm. And having been on the, uh, doing contracts between two companies for many years, I had a learning curve to realize there are things that we're not legally allowed to agree to as a public university that are standard to agree to in business to business. And so lawyers who haven't yet dealt with a publicly funded university um, will initially say, well, there's no way we can agree to this. And then the lawyers get on the phone and they talk through, well, there's this law and that law, and here's how we do that instead. And you'll reach agreement, but you need to have the, the team's understanding that it's going to take some effort. Absolutely. So, um, well, we made a couple points that were kind of broad-based across all university initiatives and university partnerships. Um, really, we, we want to emphasize sort of the uniqueness of when you're choosing to partner with undergraduate programs. So there's there's a very specific checklist that I just want to kind of briefly hit here. You know, so again, we made the point is the program in computer science is the analytics and data science initiative. Is it in the business school? Remember that a machine learning class is going to look very different if it's being taught out of the business school versus out of computer science. Second, ensure that your expectations are aligned. You know, again, most undergraduate students have limited or zero domain experience, especially if they're coming out of a program where they're really becoming scientists of data. Um, they're not going to probably know much, if anything, about the specific domain um, that you're engaging them with. And so just, you know, approach that um, with altruistic intentions. So remember that engaging undergraduates really is, is, should be first and foremost about their education. This is going to be more about altruism and about developing a university long-term partnership, um, not just about reaping an immediate ROI. 
Um, the next point there is successful capstone courses and applied project courses require regular and frequent engagement. So especially when you're working with undergraduates, um, you know, don't think that you can just bring them a project or, or bring them in for one specific um, initiative and then walk away. Um, it takes a lot of care and feeding, again, especially with undergraduate programs. They require a, a, a fairly large time investment, and there is also going to be some monetary and resource investment that Bill is going to talk about in more detail uh, in a few minutes. And then, I, you know, any, any of you who might have heard me speak um, at any any initiatives here in Atlanta, you know, I talk all the time about, especially at the undergraduate level, how important it is to consider hiring local talent and how that has mutually beneficial attributes to the entire community. So, you know, we're all talking about eating local and shopping local and buying local. You know, I would add on to that hire local. Most major universities have some type of initiative happening at the undergraduate level as it relates to analytics and data science. So before you start looking for, you know, universities that are far afield, you know, start local um, because, again, that has sort of mutually beneficial um, outcomes for everybody. So, you know, as we transition from undergraduate programs to master's programs, um, you can see this graphic of, and that we have just seen this explosion of programs you can see there over the last, uh, the last 20 years, 10 years, 20 years. Um, you know, I, I have pinched this slide from Michael Rappa at North Carolina State University. He probably does a better job than just about anybody in this space in terms of tracking what's happening in the educational arena as it relates to analytics and data science. And specifically, he's done a really nice job capturing the explosive growth as it relates to master's programs. So this brings me to my next question for my colleague, Bill Franks. All right, Bill Franks, what is the skill that is most commonly included in job ads, specifically at the master's level, for analytics professionals? What do you think it is? Okay. The number so, one skill. What I would say, uh, there, there's what would most people think it is. And I think most people are going to say something technical. They need mm -hmm. to know this language or this type of analysis and so forth. From my days hiring and from my experience in, in still talking to companies now about the students they want, I think it could be something that surprises people. So mm -hmm. why don't we why don't we go and see? I'm going to guess it's something that's much squishier than a technical skill. Yeah, it is much squishier, um, squishier, albeit very important. So there you go, communications and interpersonal skills. I think you might have something to say about that. I think you recently <laughs> wrote a book on that, Bill Franks. I I did. Yes, uh, you know, winning the room was all about this, and this is something I think has been a problem at, at universities, and it, it's not just data science and analytics, but STEM in general. We all focus on all of these other things, not that they're unimportant, but when you look at the job ads, uh, particularly when you when you say analytic uh, analytics or business analysts, which tend to be viewed slightly less technical, by far the most commonly requested thing is communication interpersonal. And even with data science, which people tend to think of it as more technical, it's still uh, the biggest, it's still over half. And so I think this is the, the important thing to, to keep in mind is that as you get these students, we'll talk more about this later, <clears throat> they're not getting enough of this from their university necessarily. And one huge thing that you can offer to students as they work with you is to help them uh, tune this area of their development with the real world experience that you can offer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, we we hear students who really want to beat their chest and flex around how many programming languages they've had and and how many certifications they have and how much they're bringing to the table in terms of their technical skills. But yeah, absolutely. We see that as probably the number one thing that we hear consistently from organizations that come and talk to us here at Kennesaw State. So you know, this is an interesting graphic. I think this gets to your point. Yeah, I mean, it pretty much, it just shows what, uh, what little emphasis soft skills are getting. And I think it's not surprising the data science programs are, are even less focused on it um, than, than the others. And so this to me is a big area that we have to change. I know, you know, at KSU, for example, we're requiring multiple semesters of actual applied experience, whether it's from a capstone, a project course, or an internship. 
Um, and um, I know other universities are starting to require more and more of this. And I think it's, it's to address this. So I think there's a recognition of the need at least now, whereas I think 10 years ago, people would have thought we were crazy to discuss this need. I think people accept the need. I think there's still work to do to catch up to that need. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to help address it, you know, let's go back to the, the, the money thing. As you partner, you're, you should expect the university to ask for money to support whatever efforts they're doing. Um, that's that's what they're going to have to do. I mean, we have as much as tuition has gone up and everyone knows that just as with a large company, by the time that money comes in and gets shuffled around to the various budgets, we're not uh, we're not swimming in cash, at least not at, at, at public universities. And so, you know, you might say, well, where does money go? When we put students on projects, we have to pay for a stipend. These students literally get paid. So, you know, while companies might be paying my center to get the students on the project, I'm turning around and it's just just like if I was hiring consultants, I have to pay them. They get tuition waivers when they're working on these things. There's other expenses uh, like overhead expenses. We have a contracting team and a team that uh, takes care of all the billing and the finance, much like a company would. And we have to cover all of that with our expenses. So there actually is uh, is money. What I'll say is most universities will charge what they need to cover. Um, so it's not like a high, they're not going for big profits. Um, I would argue probably, I'm sure even some of the well-endowed private universities, they're not really trying to make money because the goal is the is students first and, 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 you know, us being a nonprofit, we can't, there was no such thing as bonuses and so forth. Uh, but we do try and be diligent in covering our expenses because if we don't cover our expenses, what ends up happening is we have to cut parts of our programs, which then just hurts the students. And so um, you just have to be prepared. Don't take offense. Don't be concerned. But in addition to money, what you're going to have to do initially is you're going to have to do some paperwork. And it's just like partnering with a company. You're going to partner with a, a university, whether it's a large one or a small one, there has to be stuff in place. And so you'll probably start standard non-disclosure confidentiality to have a discussion. I, I, I find a lot of companies, just like in the private sector, they won't talk to me about the specific problems until uh, we've signed an NDA. You'll end up working towards some type of master service agreement and then statements of work, just like you do with a consulting firm. As I already mentioned, these can take longer to set up if your company isn't familiar with working for a university, because there are some terms that we have different, including most specifically publication. Mm -hmm. Normally, there's tight confidentiality around everything that happens. Our contracts typically include the ability for our students and professors to publish, albeit um, protecting the, the core IP and, and private information, but on the methods and the approaches that were utilized and, and companies have to get uh, get used to that. And I know, Jennifer, you've mm -hmm. done that for a long time. I think companies have come around more so, but they still that that can be something that causes people stress initially, right? Yeah, absolutely. The, the whole question around intellectual property and you know what it means to publish results, um, that is always a point of conversation with companies. And, and to be clear, when we talk about publishing results, it doesn't mean that the students or the faculty or anyone wants to disclose um, any kind of secret sauce or in any way compromise uh, your competitive advantage in the marketplace. The idea is that if something novel was ultimately developed, um, the faculty that were involved, and certainly if there's master's students and doctoral students that we'll talk about in just a minute, if they were involved, they're going to want to have an opportunity to be able to publish against the concepts, um, the methods, the theoretical basis upon which that novel insight was developed. Um, frequently, universities are less interested in the monetization of the intellectual property and really just interested in ensuring that they can continue to do research and publication against the concept that was developed. So there's a lot of opportunities here for negotiation and communication. Um, certainly, um, the, the initial answer from the legal department is always going to be no, um, but certainly, you know, don't don't take no um, as the, the last answer. Um, typically, if, if you can go through the process of explaining what everybody needs to get out of the relationship, um, you can typically make that work. But again, it, it yeah. does take some some effort. Yeah. And, I, and you, you hit on it, right? I think the biggest sticking point you'll have is the IP ownership and publication rights. And so mm -hmm. there's a spectrum of universities. Some universities are very stringent and they actually want to own not only the underlying patents if it's discovered there are some universities uh, that want to attempt to own the monetization and commercialization rights mm -hmm. and i'm frankly surprised that companies partner in under those tight terms and there's others and we tend to be more on that and that are saying hey we're really in it for the educational opportunity 
you can keep the commercialization rights. We just need the ability, as Jennifer said, to keep doing the uh, research from an academic perspective. All of this points to start on those terms early. If you want to work with the university, it's probably going to take a number of months to work through all of this. So you don't want to you don't want to wait. Right. So what you should look for to work on, you know, you might say, well, what, what should we be working with universities on? Mm -hmm. And the way I always like uh, to state this is if you want a project that's important, but not urgent. Students uh, have a limited ability that, in fact, they're legally li uh, limited in how many hours they're allowed to work. They have exams, they have tests. They just can't, you can't expect them like an employee to just work all weekend on the spur of the moment if they need to, or, or stay really late a couple of nights. And so you have to plan ahead um, around the fact they can't just do whatever it takes. So what you want to find are those really important problems that keep just falling off the list this month and this quarter and next quarter. And you realize a year later, you know, we really need to get to that, that effort over here to develop that new process, but we're just not doing it. That's the perfect thing to give to a university because it's important. It'll add a lot of value to you, but you're not under a, a, a tight deadline. And Jennifer, I think there's a, yeah. you have some thoughts on this too. Yeah, absolutely. So um, when I was still in academia, I worked with a lot of different companies over 10, 15, almost 20 years, um, developing projects that were correctly aligned for students. And again, those projects are going to look different at the undergraduate master's or PhD level, but I always used to use this term, the Goldilocks zone. You're, you're looking for projects that are in that Goldilocks zone that include the dimensions that Bill mentioned, that they're important, but not necessarily time urgent. That, that's an important dimension. But I would also say they need to be complicated enough that the students are really going to have to work to understand the problem and, and really develop a non-trivial solution. But it can't be so complex that they can't realistically solve it over one semester, over one semester period. And that's going to be a little bit different for the PhD students, clearly, when you're engaged in proprietary and novel research. But certainly when you're talking about master's level students, which is really the emphasis right now, um, when you're talking about master's level students, they're, they're going to need to be able to solve that problem, typically over one semester, at most a two semester period. Um, so again, that Goldilocks zone, they can't be so complicated that they can't figure it out, but it can't be so simple that they ultimately um, would not consider it to be challenging and they're, they're not ultimately going to learn anything. So um, that kind of brings us to the checklist for master's programs. So we talked about the undergraduate initiatives. This is sort of the summary for master's, collaborating with master's programs. So, you know, we, we talked earlier about starting with the program director. Master's level programs almost always have a full-time um, director, somebody who live, eats, breathes, sleep, somebody whose purpose in life is to ensure that their master's students are collaborating with the private sector. Um, no director of any master's program, certainly no university wants to have um, students that are coming out of their program that haven't had some kind of collaborative opportunity with a, a really strong private sector partner. And so this does tend to be a full-time program. So seek out that individual at the appropriate um, master's program. I've talked about the fact that these projects really need to be in this Goldilocks zone. And Bill made some really good points earlier that, you know, grad students full stop, but more specifically graduate students are not consultants. You shouldn't just look at this as a low cost consulting opportunity. These are ultimately students and this is intended to be a learning engagement for them. Um, you can see the note here, faculty will play less of a role in master's level projects than they do in undergraduate internships or in doctoral research initiatives. So they'll, they'll typically play less of a role at the, at the master's level than they do at the undergraduate because those students are a little bit further along um, and they're able to be a little bit more self-guided. Um, and then you're gonna hear in a minute um, why doctoral research initiatives are gonna look very different than master's level projects. And then finally, where sponsorship of an undergraduate or capstone course may or may not come with an expectation of funding, you know, Bill said universities have real costs as it relates to master's level initiatives. And so there's going to be some expectation of funding that's going to be associated with that initiative. So, you know, having said all of that, um, why don't we transition over to PhD programs? So this is one of my favorite quotes, and I um, I actually heard this at a meeting at Informs. 
Um, so this actually came from 2018. I'm going to hope this person now kind of thinks about things a little bit differently, but they literally said in a room full of, of academics um, who were in data science and analytics programs, if we place PhDs who are graduating from our programs in the private sector, we have failed. I'm gonna let that statement kind of wash over all of you for a minute. Um, I, you know, there's a lot of reasons um, kind of why that historically might have been the case. Um, historically, what used to happen is you would finish your PhD in whatever discipline it was that you were working in. Historically, you would finish your PhD. You would go seek a tenure track position somewhere. Um, you would start out as an assistant professor. You would work, 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 and publish, publish, publish. You would eventually get tenure. You would become an associate professor. You would try to do some super fabulous things that would get broader recognition. You would become a full professor, and then you died. Uh, and that really used to be the career path for people who got PhDs. Um, and that could not be further from the truth today, certainly as it relates to analytics and data science. So, you know, I'll go ahead and animate a couple of these and, you know, just let these kind of kind of wash over you, um, especially in the analytics and data science space. Um, we're seeing increasingly more people going into the private sector. There's a very permeable membrane between the private sector and the academic sector. Um, I published a paper with um, Dr. Robert McGrath from the University of New Hampshire a couple years ago, um, where we were looking at um, the number of publications, as we were looking at the evolution of data science as this academic discipline, we were looking at all the publications, academic publications in the data science space, and across all those publications, hundreds of publications, about 25% actually were authored by people who had a PhD but had no academic affiliation. So they were working at PayPal or they were working at Google or they were working at Facebook or they were working um, at Zappos or they were working um, at one of these high tech companies. So the intention there or kind of the takeaway from that is that, you know, there's a lot of meaningful research that's happening in the analytics and data science space that really requires the disciplines that you develop um, as a, a first class researcher in a PhD program that now have value uh, in the private sector in a way historically that they haven't. So I know within, within our own PhD program here at Kennesaw State, I would say the majority of the students that come into our program have intention of going into the private sector after graduation, which doesn't mean that they're not planning to continue their research. Um, they're looking to go ultimately where they'll have all kinds of opportunities to continue their research, engage in the things that um, are are intellectually stimulating and actually make a lot more money to be perfectly frank than they would in uh, in academia. Um, you know, this idea of of research coming out of the private sector has really taken on a whole different flavor and really just in the last two or three years. So you can see um, I have this NSF um, program solicitation that I just popped up right there. So it's what's crazy about this is, you know, if you read the headline there, the NSF program on fairness and artificial intelligence in collaboration with Amazon. Uh, that would have never happened uh, just a couple years ago. This idea that the National Science Foundation is collaborating with the private sector to fund academic research uh, is still a fairly new phenomenon. But increasingly, that is becoming the norm as you look especially at data science programs um, across the university at the doctoral level. And so that then creates all kinds of new opportunities for corporate partnerships. Yeah, and so just, just to, to reiterate, you know, having realistic expectations, I remember uh, one of our corporate partners at the start of a project wanted to go and said, well, why don't we do status calls every Tuesday and Friday? And I said, whoa, whoa, hold on. Well, I, I said, look, <laughs> if this was a consulting engagement, that could make sense, but you can't be expecting students to have meaningful updates every single couple of days. And, and here's why, there's a real simple formula. They're gonna have limited experience. So on an hourly basis, you expect them to be less productive than your full-time employees. Mm -hmm. They're only part-time at most half-time, so 20 hours. So right away, 
uh, you're looking at a baseline productivity. They're half as productive calendar time because they're working part time, they're less experienced, and then they have limited flexibility on schedule. They're going to have exam weeks and such. So you've got to figure calendar wise, you're going to go maybe 30 percent as fast as you would if you had full time people really uh, going on it. So it's really important to come into that back to important, but not urgent. You can make great strides. Um, but calendar wise, it's just going to be a little slower. And the only way around that is you can get a bigger team. So you could get four PhD students working part time to up the man hours being put in, but you're not going to, you can't get one, uh, one student full time. Mm -hmm. You also have to be patient. And if you read this email here, this is an email, it's fabricated, but I imagine a student could in fact write this. I think I've seen emails almost this bad, um, you know, dude, what's up with that data? I know I've had conversations this bad with some of these at students. At all levels. Yes, like, at all levels. PhD. So back to the communication skills slide from a while back that companies want that. Be ready that they're going to be a little rough around the edges and you might have to give some coaching in scenarios like this. Also be ready. They could do a faux pas at any time. I literally had a student, this is not him, show up to present to a VP of a major corporation results wearing a t-shirt, shorts, and flip-flops. He and I had a conversation after that, and uh, needless to say, he did not show up that way again, at least as long as he was working with me. But you have to under expect, again, these, these are students. And last, help them understand how to communicate. And here, I don't know who put this absolutely shameless <laughs> plug. Who put that shameless? Bill oh Griffin. Goodness. I'm going to blame Bill yeah. Griffin. Okay. He must have added a, a, a copy of my book in on the, on the slide. But uh, winning the room is all about getting students to, and professionals, obviously, to present and communicate effectively. And you know, really the only way to do that is practice. And that's the one thing I would say, if you look at all, if all the companies that are out there did more to work with students and prepare them, even if you hired someone else's students, you don't hire all the ones that you help prepare, the community as a whole is preparing students better and everyone's gonna be happier. So this is really not just purely altruistic, giving back to the community. This is literally helping yourself. If all of you out there partnered better with universities, all of our students will be better off mm -hmm. and more prepared for you. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, Bill, where could they buy that book? Is that book available on Amazon? It sure is. Oh, okay, good. Um, so, you know, we've gone through these checklists, right, as we talk about the undergraduate programs and the master's programs. So we have a checklist for you as it relates to doctoral programs. So just to reiterate some of these points, you know, recognize that a relationship, a research based relationship with a university is typically a long term engagement. So this is not like a master's level project where you you come in for one semester and then you come out really research novel research that really ultimately is non trivial that's going to add value to your organization and it's going to be publishable, which would be the coin of the realm for the student and for the faculty, that typically is a long term engagement. I know within our organization here at Kennesaw State, um, we have research labs that have been around for three, four, five, six plus years. Um, and it's really once you start to have those long term engagements that those publications and those research results really start to manifest in a deep and meaningful way. Um, again, just like what we see at the, excuse me, at the master's level, at the doctoral level, you're typically going to have a, a full-time program director. These are big jobs. Um, and so you're probably going to have somebody who's living, eating, breathing, sleeping, um, doctoral level um, analytics and data science research. And it is their responsibility to work with organizations like yours um, if you just try to pick up the phone for especially an assistant professor and just say, hey, I'd like to partner with you, um, you know, they may or may not return your call. So you're always better off going to the program director, the center, or the institute director. Um, doctoral students are really like employees, excuse me, at a university because they're here for four, five years. Um, we try to kick them out after five years, um, but but some have been known to stick around. But the point there is that because they are really here for some extended period of time, they will typically have their own page on the university website. So you can go out there and take a look at the types of initiatives that students and faculty are involved in and see if any of that research is aligned with what your organization is trying to accomplish. Um, you know, this again goes back to the fact that doctoral programs typically are four to five years. 
Um, these are great programs, again, for long-term engagements, um, but they're probably not the right place to turn if you're looking for a massive pipeline of entry-level talent. That's not done at the at the doctoral level. Um, if you're looking for those big pipelines of talent, that's going to be more at the master's level or potentially at the undergraduate level. You know, we've spent a fair amount of time talking about research and publication. Um, and then, you know, again, back, back to some of the points that Bill made earlier, um, there, you need to start early in terms of negotiating um, what the funding needs to look like, uh, what the terms need to look like in terms of who owns the data, who owns the IP, what the publication policies need to look like, um, and what the monetization policies are going to look like. Um, again, the answer is almost always going to be no when you when you first start um, with your legal department, um, but it's certainly worth continuing the conversation because those agreements typically can be found. So that's the checklist for doctoral students. Um, you know, so kind of going back to where we were in the very beginning of this talk, you know, I identified that, you know, most organizations are really struggling with getting the most out of their investments in analytics and data science initiatives. Um, and, you know, we think that there's really a role here for universities to close the gap on that. A lot, you know, another shameless plug for another who, book. But a lot of the points, a lot of the themes that we've been talking about in this, uh, in this presentation actually come from this book, again, that I co-authored with Dr. Robert McGrath from the University of New Hampshire. So um, it can also be found on Amazon. So I think that concludes uh, concludes our notes and our and our primary remarks. Bill, we can hand it back to you if there's specific questions that are coming in in the chat. That's great. Yes, absolutely. I will uh, pose those up right now. Anybody else who has a question, please put it in the uh, the chat. Um, I'm going to pull one real quick. Um, some companies prefer to pay the students directly as interns, so that so that paperwork can be reduced. What's your thoughts? on pros and cons of the two models, pay to the university versus pay directly to the students? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and we have some experience with that. So so maybe I'll take a first shot at it and then okay. Bill, you can add, add any commentary. So, you know, I like to say I was the perfect parent before I had children. Um, I was, uh, I knew exactly what a, um, a, a an analytics and data science institute research um, initiative was going to look like before we actually had students. And so when we originally set this up, when we when we first set up our analytics and data science institute that eventually grew into what we now have is the school of data science, um, we had set up that exact model um, where the organizations would pay the students directly. So there's a couple challenges with that. The, the first challenge is that at certainly when you're talking about the master's level and the and the PhD level, um, many of the students are um, are are here on visas, student visas. so they're they're not US citizens. They're not legal to work in the United States. And so you can't pay them directly, legally. Um, so that that was very problematic, you know, kind of day one when we first started admitting students who were not legal to work in the United States. And yet we wanted them to work collaboratively with these organizations. So by paying the university, we can set it up as a, um, let me take a step back. Most master students and most PhD students get a graduate stipend of some sort, um, like a graduate research assistantship, a GRA. That's a very standard initiative at a university. So the, the companies then through, through the partnerships, they then fund the GRA effectively for the student by paying the center, paying the university, and then we use that money to fund the GRA. Um, if the student is legal to work in the United States, you know there, there's no problem with them getting paid directly then the problem or the, the downside becomes that the student doesn't get course credit um, for, the, for the work. So if, um, if the student is, is signed up for like a three-hour capstone course or a three-hour course internship, effectively the payment becomes those, uh, those credit hours that the student then gets credit for. Um, paying them directly um, is a uh, it, it's sort of problematic in terms of setting up um, setting up one of those internships. 
So there, there are ways to get around that if you want to pay the student directly, but those are some of the challenges I know that we've experienced as, as we've worked with companies. So Bill, I don't know if you've yeah. got anything to add. I'll just add one or two other angles, which is it really depends too, if you're after a strategic partnership or just a tactical body for a, a semester. So I, I would say hiring a student directly for a one semester tactically, it is less paperwork to pay a student uh, directly. And that's a fine. So I, I mean, we, we have companies that we work with, with our more intensive partnerships that still hire interns every summer. It's not an either or. Mm -hmm. But the key is, if this is a longer term thing, actually contracting with the university could be less paperwork because you set up one master agreement. Mm -hmm. And then we the university sends you one bill for however many students are working and the professor in one chunk. And we can renew that as students graduate. We can ro we roll new students on automatically. You don't have to go through an interview process and such and you all on your own. I mean, we'll let you vet the students, but we'll bring them to you. So there are some benefits. If you're going to have a true partnership that expands over time, time being multiple years, mm -hmm. it will actually be less work in the in the long run if you uh, are, are working with the university to get the, uh, the students. Mm -hmm. It's a great question. Great question. Yeah, I've got a couple more here that that, that came in that uh, I think could could definitely benefit from your experience. One is, do you have any helpful tips from the university side that may help curb the sticker shock that industry partners, um, you know, may have around uh, the the prescribed overhead rates that you might be charging? Is there anything in your history that that helps that from a, from from the university side? Huh. Sticker shock. I, I don't know. Do we? I don't think we really had sticker shock. I don't know that any organization has said, "Wow, that's that's too much money." I, I think what is so there are some companies who say we simply don't have budget for anything right now, including that. I don't typically think. I don't recall someone who said. There's only one case I remember where anybody said, wow, that seems high, but they were doing the mistake of comparing us to their cheapest offshore option. And it was the mm -hmm. procurement person who said, well, seems like we could get a cheaper hourly rate just by hiring these people from this offshore company. And I told the procurement person on the call, I said, well, then you should do that if that's yeah. all you're after. Right. We're not here to compete with offshore uh, staff augmentation, right? That has a purpose. If you need it, go hire that. But we're here to for, for, for different purposes. That was one out of dozens and dozens of conversations. I think the key is just be prepared that you will likely be asked to fund some level of money. I think when you really sit back and look at what are you going to pay a new hire uh, out of school, what are you paying your current employees? It's going to be it's going to be a good deal. It's certainly going to be a lot less than it than, than most other. Um, onshore consultants by far. Yeah. Um, but but again, there's also that aspect of you're supporting a university, you're helping students get their stipend. So it's not all, um, there is a purpose beyond simply the idea of getting that that work done as well. Great. A couple more. Um, I think we got another, another minute or so with, um, from our colleague Irv Lustig. Uh, when the university signs a non-disclosure and confidentiality agreement with a company, what does the university do to educate the students and maybe even the professors on understanding the boundaries of what can be disclosed and what is considered confidential? That's a great question. And you know what I, I would say? I know in our case, I've got uh, I make every student and faculty member sign a, a an agreement with the center that talks about these very things here. Here's, you know, you're, you're agreeing to keep this confidential. Here's what it looks like. We make very clear. If you ever have doubt, come and ask. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the reality is I, I could see someone saying it just seems really risky. I throw that back and say, you know what, whenever you, you sign a confidential ag agreement with any company, whether it's a vendor, whether it's a consultant, whether it's uh, someone you're selling to at the end of the day, you're trusting that they're going to keep that confidential, and they're and and any of those organizations at any point could have someone who who doesn't respect mm -hmm. it enough. I would say universities are probably a little more sensitive to such things because there's such concern over properly referencing, documenting, and sourcing information. That I've actually been impressed. Having come from the corporate world, I do feel like the university as a whole, students and faculty actually take it more seriously than a lot of my commercial coworkers did. Not to say commercial people didn't take it seriously. I'm just saying that. Uh, I, I would be less worried about those violations um, at a university in some ways. And and then if they happen, you just have to deal with it. Yeah, I would, yeah absolutely. And then I would just add with some of the companies that we've worked with in the past, um, if it's going to be a long-term engagement, especially if there's doctoral students involved, is they'll send us laptops. Um, and then those laptops are really the only portal that the students and faculty can use 
to go through the VPN to access the data that's in question. So we never actually bring the data in-house. We never bring it into the university. Um, and the students are very restricted in terms of how they can physically access the data. They can typically only do it through the assigned laptop. Wonderful. Well, I think that actually concludes our time. I think there's a couple more questions that maybe we can um, we can manage offline and, and get answers directly to those individuals, but I don't want to take up any more uh, time than individuals have already given us today. So with that being said, thank you uh, to everyone for joining us today on behalf of Bill, Jennifer, Kennesaw State, uh, <laughs> Kennesaw State University School of Data Science and Analytics and INFORMS. I thank you for joining us today. A recording of this webinar will be available on our YouTube channel very shortly. Thank you very much, everybody, and have a great day. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, Bill and Jennifer. Bye.